Most people have had that feeling at some time. And if you haven't, there will be a time when you do, when you feel like God is doing a number on you. You either feel it because it can only be explained by God or you feel it because God could have stopped it and he didn't. He could have changed it and he didn't. He could have, he could have made it better and he didn't. And you become disappointed with God and you feel like he's just killing you. Meaning you just want to die. You just, you're just dying, either literally or emotionally or, you know, you're just dying. God, why are you killing me? In the last 24 hours, I've talked to five people, five different individuals who were dying, dying. That is, who felt like they were unraveling, either emotionally or circumstantially or career-wise, or they were, they were hurting, and God was nowhere to be found. In fact, sometimes it looks like God is toying with you. Because sometimes it looks like it's getting better, then it gets worse. It looks like it's getting better, then it gets worse. Then it, you know. Finally, it looks like he answered your prayer, and they ain't not answering your prayer. You know? You feel like he just, he's killing you. Because I'm, I'm praying to you, and it's not getting better. You tell me you love me. I don't feel like you love me. You tell me you're going to be with me. I can't see you. And it's getting worse. And I'm dying. Why is God killing me? 2 Corinthians 1 says in verse 8, For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of the affliction which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we despise the even of life. Wow. How bad was it, Paul? Verse 9, the first line, indeed we have the sentence of death written on ourselves. He says it was bad. I mean, it was really, really bad. He says it was affliction, and then he throws in this phrase, it was beyond our strength. So what I want to do right now is I want to demythologize. I want to remove a myth that we have all, we have all quoted, said, felt, repeated to other people and to ourselves. And the myth is, God won't put more on you than you can bear. I want to remove that myth. It sound good. Sound like something God would say. Sounds like it works. That God won't put more on us than we can bear. Not true. Paul says it was beyond our strength. In other words, it was beyond our capacity to bear it. We couldn't, you know, we couldn't take any more. I can't take this. I can't handle this. I'm dying. He says, and the sentence of death was on us. In other words, the, the next thing on the agenda was to die rather than live like this, rather than bear this, rather than go through this. He's saying God put more on us than we could bear because the there was only one thing left, to die. 
many of you have been through that? You, you just want to die. You, you want to die. You know? Maybe you're too scared of dying, but too afraid to live. Too afraid to die, but too, don't want to live anymore. You know? It, it, dying. I, it says it was all over me. And, and it was more than we could bear. Sunday, we talked about a phrase. In knowing God that said, being conformed, the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death. And the statement I made was, when God sends us through, and it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse, you praying and praying and praying and praying, and it's not getting better. That is an invitation to a deeper experience with him. The fellowship of his sufferings. Fellowship is, is our sharing of life. Being conformed to his death, he wants to change something, remove something. Something is there. Paul goes on to say, listen to his word. In verse 9, indeed, we have the sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Listen to me. When you are dying, the sentence of death, you're dying. that will always have one reality tied to it and that one reality tied to it because you know you've hit this place because you can't fix this. That, that's the common denominator. The reason that you want to give up is there is no fixing in sight. You can't fix it and you don't know anybody who can. All your human resources have been depleted. Why did he do that to you, Paul? He says, so that we would not trust in ourselves. God allows us to get to the point where if this is ever going to be fixed, he is the only one who can do it. Paul said, the reason God put me here was to train, change my focus of trust. I had to deal with a trust issue. See, Paul is a very talented man. Paul, Paul, Paul isn't kind of some get-by guy. Paul is very talented. His resume reads to the top of the list. Paul could do it all. So to take Paul deeper in faith, he had to put him in a situation he could not fix, that his resume could not handle, that his abilities could not change so that he would learn to trust God. So to force him to a deeper faith level, he put him in a situation he couldn't handle beyond his strength. He couldn't deal with it because he was driving him to a deeper level of experience with him. The word we use for this is brokenness. Brokenness is simply when God strips us of our self-sufficiency. When God removes our tendency to depend upon ourselves. The problem is not using our abilities or using our gifts or using our talents or using our contacts. God puts those things there for us to utilize in his purposes. But when he sees that we have relied on those, you know, we trust in the horses the Old Testament talks about and the bows and the arrows. We don't just use them. We bank on them. So that 
even if we don't pray, we know we got this ace in the hole. Even if we don't look to God, we know we got this thing over here we can go to in case God don't work. If God is trying to take us to this deeper experience, then he literally puts you in an I can't situation. I can't handle it. I can't take it. I'm, I'm going to crack under this. But in God who raises the dead, God who raises the dead. It takes an awful lot of power to raise something dead. Yeah, you got to have a little something, so you got to have some juice to raise the dead, okay? One thing you know, if something was dead that got up, whatever got it up, got a little something, something going on. Because it takes some juice to raise the dead. One of our problems with God is we've never seen him raise the dead. We have never seen, so many Christians, have never seen God take a hopeless situation and flip it. Because it's in those times when he takes something that's hopeless, and you see no way, no how. And he flips that. That God has now become real to you at a level that he was not before. Like Job, it's easy to say, I've heard about him with the hearing of the ear. That's easy. You can do that every Sunday, every Wednesday. Hear about him with the hearing of the ear. But it's a whole nother thing to say, I have seen him with my own eyes. That's a whole different paradigm when the understanding of the reality of God has now burst on the scene because you watched the resurrection. That's why God let Lazarus die. He says, I let Lazarus die because I want to show you something. And Martha and Mary were all upset. They said, you know, you know, if you would have been here, and Jesus stayed away on purpose. Let him die. Because he wanted to show them a resurrection. Is God being mean? Is he being honorary? It feels that way when you're going through it, but what he's really doing is trying to take you deeper. He's trying to blow your mind because that's what a resurrection does. It blows your mind. Don't stop God from blowing your mind. Every situation is different. Every person is different. So I'm not giving a blanket scenario for every circumstance. I'm just dealing with a principle. Why are you killing me? Why is this sentence of death? I'm dying here, God. I'm dying. Paul says, because he, he wanted us to see a resurrection. Look at this. Verse 10. Who delivered us from so great a peril of death and will deliver us? He on whom we have set our hope and he will deliver us. Do you see that? Three times in that verse, he says, I am delivered, I will be delivered, and I will be delivered. I don't know what grave you're in. And some of us aren't six feet under, we 16 feet under. You know, it's just getting a deeper hole, the hole is getting deeper. And you have done everything you know to do. It's, it's this one thing if you haven't done what you're supposed to do, what God tells you to do, but, but you've done that. In fact, you're tired of doing that. And sometimes you feel like you could just get away from God. Just, just leave me alone. Okay? And you might as well tell God you feel that because you know you're thinking it. You know, it's amazing to me how people won't be honest with God like God won't know if you don't say it. 
He know you're mad at him. He know you feel like he's taking too long. He know he feels like you've forgotten him and you done moved on to somebody else trying to sing Kumbaya, my Lord. He, he knows all that. He is well aware. And you might as well tell him, God, I, you have disappointed me. He, Paul says, we have the sentence of death on us. And God did it so that God might let us see that he raises the dead and will deliver us. We have set our hope on him. Verse 11 says, you're joining us and helping us through your prayers so that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the favor bestowed on us through the prayers of many. Don't be ashamed to pray and to call for prayer when you're in your cemetery. There's some people here tonight who are in a cemetery and you're just looking for your headstone. You're looking for where they've dug the hole. You don't even need a casket. You're just ready to fall in there because you're tired. I didn't know we would begin our service the way we did tonight, but I think if Paul was here, he would tell you, when I was going through that time, my story wasn't over. Because I, I was ready, I thought death was the next thing. But that wasn't the end of my story. God delivered. There were some more chapters to be written. Don't give up on God. I know you want to sometimes. And there are very few people who don't go through this valley. There's not too many people who don't go through this valley where it looks like God is gone. Job said, I looked north and couldn't find you. He said, I looked south and couldn't find you. I looked east and couldn't find you. I looked west and could not find you. But then Job went on to say, but when you're finished with me, I will come forth as pure gold. So I want you to tell God in your time with him this week how you feel. I want you to be raw. If you're in this situation, this is not a time for theological platitudes where you don't even know what you're saying. Because <laughs> you're speaking in, you know, this, this highfalutin language. No, this is time to get raw. Thank God, God, you, you're killing me. One of the five told me yesterday, they said, if this is God, if this is God, this is God trying to teach me or break me. If this is God, he's killing me. But that was the same one that got the phone call this afternoon that raised the dead. Wow. Don't give up. I know you're tired. I know you're hurting. I know you're crying. I know you're suffering. And I know sometimes he is hard to find. But remember, when God is silent, he is not still. <laughs>